This video tutorial will help solve free response question number five from the 2012 AP Chemistry exam. Let's three, read through the problem. At 298K in one atmosphere, the standard state of bromine is a liquid, where the standard, whereas the standard state of iodine is a solid. The enthalpy change for the formation of bromine and iodine gases from these elemental forms are given in the table above. So you're shown a table of the delta H's of formation of both bromine and iodine gas. Question states, explain why the delta H of formation for iodine gas from the solid is larger than the delta H of formation of bromine gas from the liquid. Now this is important. In your explanation, identify the type of particle interactions. They want to know what type of attractive forces are present and a reason for the difference in magnitude of those interactions. So there are two possible right answers for this. Um, what I want you to notice and remember is that both bromine and iodine are diatomics and therefore uh, have totally nonpolar uh, attractive forces. The only IMFs, intermolecular forces, that are present are London dispersion forces, shown as, uh, or shorthanded as LDFs, London dispersion forces. And therefore, it appears that the LDFs are stronger in iodine versus bromine. Why would that be? Well, uh, iodine is a much bigger atom. It has more electrons, and it's a larger size, has a greater ease of polarizability. So I think that's the best possible answer is this. Uh, let's write it in red. Um, LDFs are greater in iodine because larger, more electrons, and that's probably enough for the AP, but you also could write uh, a greater ease of polarizability. Another possible correct explanation for the differences in delta H of formation of the gases is shown in, in answer number two, uh, written here. Um, based basically, uh, primarily on the phase changes. Uh, if you notice, the iodine goes from a solid to a gas. That's sublimation. So the total delta H um, would be the the sum of the delta H of fusion plus vaporization, whereas bromine goes from a liquid phase to a gas phase, only one phase change instead of two. So the delta H of formation for the gas phase is simply vaporization only. So you have a higher magnitude when the delta H's of formation go through two phase changes instead of one. Question B is very similar. Predict which of the two processes shown, again, the uh, phase change from liquid to a gas in the case for bromine, a solid to a gas in the case of iodine, which has a greater change in entropy. And I, I think this should be uh, patently obvious that um, uh, iodine goes from the solid phase, the phase of matter which has the lowest entropy, highly ordered phase of matter, to a gas phase, the most disorder or the highest entropy. So the delta S would be the sum of, again, two phase changes from solid to liquid, then liquid to gas. Whereas for bromine, the delta S, uh, the entropy change would just be for vaporization from liquid to a gas. So again, uh, same answer and virtually the same justification. Part C asks the following, iodine solid and bromine liquid can react to form the compound IBR. Predict which would have the greater molar enthalpy of vaporization, IBR or bromine liquid, and justify that. And again, this is a question about attractive forces. The higher molar enthalpy of vaporization would correspond with the, uh, the compound or material that has the greater attractive forces. You have to put more energy in to, uh, to break those attractive forces and uh, form the vapor from the, from the liquid or, or solid phase. So let's think about the two compounds that are present. Bromine is a diatomic molecule. It's totally nonpolar. The only attractive forces, again, are LDFs, or London dispersion forces. And by the way, it's just fine to write LDF on the exam. The uh, AP graders will understand what that means. Now, IBR, in contrast, is slightly polar because both iodine and bromine will have slightly different uh, electronegativities, and therefore there is a slight polarity to them. So 
IBR will have London dispersion forces, but will also have dipole-dipole attractive forces. So there are two different, I should say the magnitude of the attractive forces between IBR molecules is greater than between bromine diatomic molecules. And therefore, the delta H of vaporization for IBR is greater. And the justification is, as I've just stated, because there are greater dipole-dipole attractive forces than just LDFs present in bromine. Part D of the question is a little more complex. Um, let me read and summarize the question. An experiment is performed to compare the solubilities of iodine in different solvents, water, and hexane. And essentially, at the end of the question, they tell you the results. The hexane layer becomes light purple, while the water layer remains virtually colorless. So that means that the iodine has dissolved into the hexane layer, but not the water layer. Why? That's the question. Um, your explanation, again, should include the relative strength of interactions between water and both, I'm sorry, between iodine and both water and hexane and the reason for those differences. Now, why is the hexane layer purple? Because iodine dissolves more readily in hexane than in water. Why is that true? Remember, iodine is a, uh, is a diatomic nonpolar molecule and there will be much stronger attractive forces between nonpolar hexane and nonpolar iodine than between um, iodine, again nonpolar, and highly polar water. An additional factor is what's shown below. Hydrogen bonding between water molecules is very strong, and any IMF, intermolecular force, between iodine molecules and water will be much weaker and unable to break those attractive forces. So iodine won't dissolve into water, but it will dissolve into nonpolar hexane uh, because there are pretty strong London dispersion forces in iodine, such a large uh, molecule, many, many electrons. And the final subpart to the question asks a student, um, as, adds a small crystal of potassium iodide to a test tube. It's corked. The iodine ion reacts to form the I3 minus ion, a linear species. They're giving you a hint there about the structure. Um, in the box below, draw the complete Lewis diagram for this ion, I3 minus. Well, to draw any Lewis structure, we always count up the total number of valence electrons, seven each from three iodines. That's 21, plus the one minus from the charge on the ion. So the total number of electrons is 22 electrons. And they told us that it was linear. That was a nice hint. Uh, so we have three iodines, and we're going to form a uh, covalent bond between each iodine. So that's two, four out of the 22 electrons that have been used up. So we've used four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, add pairs to form an octet on the uh, terminal atoms. And we've used 16 out of 22. So that means I've got six more electrons to use. So I'm going to have three lone pairs around the central iodine there. Now, don't forget, on an ionic species, you have to show the charge on the structure. So you draw brackets and a charge on the entire structure. The final subpart of this question asks, in which layer water or hexane would the concentration of I3 minus ion be higher? And of course, uh, it's higher in the water layer because water is a polar solvent and there are strong ion dipole attractions between the I3 minus ion and water. Whereas in hexane, which is a nonpolar solvent, there's not as strong interactions. Those IMFs are just not possible in hexane, a nonpolar solvent. <laughs> 